So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for the second yeah. forum in our Sunshine Series, Shining a Light on Open Records, Learning How to Make a Public Records Request in Ohio. Uh, my name is Savon Smalls. I am the Midwest Regional Comm Strategist at Common Cause, and I work with the incredible Ohio team. Um, before we get started, I have just a couple of quick housekeeping items that I want to share. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the very end of this webinar, so feel free throughout to put any questions in the Q&A box as we go along. Um, we're going to try to make sure that we have some time to answer them uh, at the end, as I mentioned. Uh, additionally, we're also going to be sending out a follow-up email with some PowerPoint slides and additional information about the program. Um, as you may have noticed when you hopped on, uh, this webinar is recording. Um, additionally, uh, there should be a closed captioning feature uh, for those of us who need it for accessibility reasons. Uh, so with that, our agenda this evening includes an overview of the importance of public records, as well as our ability to access them. Uh, so you're going to hear from some incredible and esteemed panelists today. Uh, Gary Daniels, who is a chief lobbyist at the ACLU of Ohio. Randy Ludlow, who is a former Columbus Dispatch reporter, as well as an open government advocate, as well as Catherine Terser, who is the executive director of Common Cause Ohio. Uh, so with that, they're going to have a discussion and then uh, we're going to end with questions and answers, as I mentioned a couple of times. Um, so now I'm going to pass over to Catherine uh, to give an overview of tonight's program. Well, before we get started, I just wanted to do a big thank you to all the folks that are co-sponsoring this. It can be hard to get the word out about this kind of session. And so a big thank you to the Ohio Fair Courts Alliance, the Ohio News Media Association, Ohio Citizen Action. ACLU Ohio and all voting is local. Uh, you know, it's great when we're able to team up to do this. Uh, and a big thank you to, to, to our panelists for joining us today. You know, these, these kind of discussions are so important. I always say that when it comes to we the people, if we actually want a representative democracy that works, that it's not enough just to participate, you know, on election day. It's not just enough to vote, that we actually need to understand what's happening in government and we need to be able to act on it. And that's why we need to have all sorts of good information. We need to be able to get a peek behind the curtain so that we can understand decisions that are being made. Now, of course, you know, greater transparency is so important when it comes to corruption. Um, and, and when we think about kind of the history of our access to good information, you know, it does really go back to Watergate and it does go back to those early, you know, the early establishment of FOIA. Um, and one of the things, you know, there are a lot of times, how can I put this? I, I'm a little bit embarrassed by the things that we do in Ohio, but one of the things that I have always been extremely proud of is that we actually have a decent sunshine law. We have access to emails. We have access to voicemails and blueprints. And, and that in fact, we consider things public records um, that other states don't necessarily. Um, and so, you know, we included this comment um, uh, from Justice uh, Donnelly uh, because it's that thing of like, even like a tweet DM can actually be a public record. and. And, you know, we, the people, are stronger when we have access to good information. We can participate better when it comes time to testify. We become better voters because we have access to this good information. And, you know, I'm so pleased that our reporters here in the state of Ohio have such good access to information. And with that, I'm actually going to hand it off to Gary Daniels from the ACLU. Now, I've always been really impressed when Gary testifies. He's always like, I'm the chief lobbyist for ACLU Ohio. Now, the rest of us are always a little like, now the oh, we're always a little like shy about saying we're lobbyists, but Gary is very proud of it. And I think that's really important that there are many of us that are public interest lobbyists and spend our days at the state house. And Gary is one of the best. And with that, Gary, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, I always like to butter up the crowd first and uh, say thank you to all of you for being here. It's uh, at least here in Columbus, it's still a sunny 
uh, Wednesday evening, and uh, here you all are uh, listening to people talk about public records. So that makes you my kind of people, and uh, I'm happy to be here with uh, all of you. Um, as Catherine pointed out, I'm a lobbyist over at the State House, but I've had a variety of positions at the ACLU of Ohio, uh, including many years uh, as part of the legal team doing uh, investigations and research. And so um, I had a lot of experience with public records then because uh, at the ACLU of Ohio, we use public records on a daily basis uh, to do investigations and uh, confirming what people say and tracking down records and a whole wide variety of other things. Um, uh, quick mention, you know, this is uh, this is uh, going to be almost uh, or, you know exclusively about public records, but when you talk about sunshine laws in Ohio, you're talking about public records and you're also talking about open meetings and Ohio's Open Meetings Act. Um, this could be a three or four hour program quite easily. I have a feeling if you wind me and Randy up, we could go forever uh, about this particular topic. But this is going to be pretty exclusive to public records. We can talk about open meetings as this goes on and in response uh, uh, to your questions. But I have found having done many of these programs uh, over the years, uh, the real interest is in the public records part. The open meetings part is, is pretty easy to understand. So again, we can get into that later uh, uh, if you wish. But you see on the screen in front of you uh, the legal definition here in Ohio, in the Ohio Revised Code. Uh, with regard to what exactly is a public record, and it, it's a, what it sounds like. Uh, it is uh, documents, uh, not only documents, but as Catherine mentioned, it can be a whole host of different things. It can be texts, it can be emails, it can be blueprints, it can be maps, it can be all kinds of things that fall into this broad definition of a public record that's kept by a public office, that is, a government entity. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that can be city council, it can be the board of county commissioners, it can be the local police department, it could be the Ohio en Environmental Protection Agency, it could be a local school or a local school board. There is a whole wealth of information out there available to Ohioans, and, and I hope uh, as a result of this, uh, you're, you're better uh, uh, educated and prepared to cause trouble out there, because that's what I want you to do with all this, is cause trouble and hold government accountable uh, with regard to this uh, this information. So the screen there in front of you, you see what a public record is and what records include. And I think probably the most important part um, of, of what a record is, is it, it, uh, it uh, documents the function of that office, what the office does, what the government entity does. So occasionally you can get tripped up requesting public records and get denied because they will claim that it doesn't, you know, they're not relying on it uh, basically to conduct uh, uh, the public's uh, business. Uh, Catherine, the next slide, please. So there is there are exceptions to public records. Now, backing up a little bit, records in Ohio are presumed to be open under the law unless there is an exception written into the law. And unfortunately, over the years, uh, we keep adding exception after exception to the law. Uh, we used to do A to Z, and then we ran out of out of letters of the alphabet. So now we're on to AA, BB, CC, and, and in the, the area uh, of the Ohio Revised Code that covers public records, there are at least 47 exceptions there. Some of them make perfect sense. Uh, medical records, adoption records, DNA records. Um, there are other things out there that, uh, that protect uh, people's personal privacy. Uh, at the ACLU of Ohio, for instance, our view of public records is it's to document and keep track of what the government is doing, not to document and keep track of what your neighbors are doing. So we are generally favorable towards uh, public records exceptions at the ACLU of Ohio um, that aren't meant essentially to, to spy on your neighbors, uh, let's say. Uh, the one thing that gives an awful lot of people headaches out there that, that, that do run into this, and I'm sure Randy would confirm this and has run into it, probably far more often than the ACLU of Ohio has, is that clear ex exemption right there. Confidential law enforcement investigatory records. Again, some of these make perfect sense. You know, it's a, you can't file a public records request and be successful looking, for instance, uh, for the confidential witness uh, that, a, that a police department might be using. 
but this is uh, uh, no surprise government, the police departments, the sheriff's offices, the highway patrol, everybody uh, seems to read this exemption very broadly uh, when it comes to public records requests. Um, that is what, you know, what they don't have to turn over um, while we're always doing a tug of war with them with regard to what it is we actually want. So there are some good reasons for that clear exemption, but it's it's something that I think uh, uh, over the years uh, has, has been abused an awful lot uh, to purposely keep uh, information out of the hands of Ohioans and the newspapers and what have you. Catherine, next uh, slide, please. And I'm going to be going through this. You know, you have other questions. We'll get to them in Q&A. So this is kind of a, a crash course um, uh, uh, with regard to this. Uh, uh, and, and it'll be fleshed out more as we go on. There's going to be some obstacles to, to getting public records. Um, it's, you do enough of these, you tend to run into the same ones over and over again. So I, you know, I jotted down some here that are uh, uh, on the screen. I think, and I'd be interested to hear later what Randy's opinion of this is, but the, the biggest hurdle that I have oftentimes run into and my colleagues have is a lack of knowledge about the law at the government office that you're requesting those records from. Many times the people requesting the records appear to know the law better than the people that actually have to fulfill their requests. Um, these people oftentimes, you know, a public records request is only such a tiny amount of their job um, that you know they are not up to date and up to speed on these things as much as we would all like them to do. At the same time, you might have a larger municipal police department where they have a public records division, where they have people there staffed specifically to uh, comply with and fulfill public records requests. But that, that lack of knowledge is a very big hurdle many times uh, uh, to get around. Ohio law also doesn't have firm deadlines with regard to, to when records need to be produced. When you read the law, uh, Ohio Revised Code section 149.43, when you read it, um, it talks about essentially having the right to go in and copy and inspect records on the spot is pretty much how it reads. Uh, but this is real life, uh, and that is, uh, practically speaking, not always possible uh, to just waltz in and, you know, especially with a complex public records request. And, you know, they're not about to let you start rooting through the file cabinets and searching the computer network and everything looking for records. So uh, over the years, those of us who deal with this a lot uh, have learned to sort of navigate this, even if there isn't a firm deadline in the law. I know on the legislative end of things, we get nervous whenever people talk about establishing firm deadlines in the law, because what that could mean is that those firm deadlines are much less friendly to government transparency um, than they are to uh, letting the sun shine in and, and getting some of this uh, information. Practically speaking, again, the personnel capacity at the government office, just to give you an example, I can remember years ago, we were looking for uh, information, looking for records at a particular small uh, village in Ohio, village being a, a, a subdivision uh, of, uh, you know, you get your cities and your towns and your counties and you've got your villages and your townships and what have you. They had a clerk who was there a half a day on Wednesdays every week. And that was the only time that she was in was that half a Wednesday once a week. Um, I called on Thursday looking for records. Um, she wasn't going to be in until the following Wednesday. You know, that might be an extreme example, but it's an idea sometimes of where personnel capacity at the government office uh, uh, can uh, lead to some of these obstacles in getting public records. You shouldn't take it as an excuse or let them off the hook all the time. Um, I think many times, you know, they lean on that excuse uh, when there are times that uh, uh, that they don't have to and, and they just don't want to turn over those records. Speaking of which, deliberate withholding or stalling. When you're the ACO of Ohio uh, requesting records, you know, there's a fair amount of times you run into that deliberate withholding or stalling uh, of records. And, uh, and that's something that people need to be aggressive about with regard to getting those records requests. But and sometimes, quite frankly, the problem is on the RN, the requestor's end of records, because we have incomplete or unclear or broad requests that make it very difficult for that government official to fulfill our requests. Catherine, next slide, please. 
some quick advice for public records requests. Now, number one, up on your screen there, you see that the ACLU of Ohio, and there's a link in the chat, keep an eye on your government, the activists how to guide. Um, we update this whenever uh, we think that it's necessary. This is a publication that we've been putting out for many years. Everything that is being talked about tonight is in that guide, including a sample public records request. So I invite you to uh, uh, look at that and uh, hopefully that provides uh, additional information that you might be looking for. But some quick tips, submit your request in writing. Um, that's about the number one type of thing. You don't want to call on the phone. You don't want to you know, do things like that. You don't want to show up at the office. You want to have some sort of paper trail you know, so that people can see what exactly you're requesting, what date you requested it on, you know, all of those sorts of things. You know, let your fingers do the Googling. Uh, go and, and see who might be the best person, the best department uh, to contact with regard to records requests. Understandably, if you're contacting a police department or county commissioners or something like that, you might not know who the best person to, to contact is. But online, oftentimes, you can get a much better idea, especially in bigger cities or bigger police departments or bigger school systems where they have people, again, dedicated to specifically fulfilling public records requests as their entire duty or as a large part of their duty. You want to also make the request as specific as possible. I cannot emphasize that enough because many times that is why records requests are denied or not entirely fulfilled to everybody's satisfaction. Uh, and the courts are, are uh, very cognizant of this and sometimes unforgiving of this. I think that you should be able to submit a public records request and say, I want all of government officials so-and-so's emails from the past year. But if you do that, you're probably going to be denied. And if you take it to court, the court is likely to deny you those public records requests because of the sheer volume and practical difficulty of getting those. Again, it's a government document. I think you're entitled to it. The courts basically have a different opinion about that. So you don't want to do all of the emails from the past year. What was the topic? Who were the recipients, if you know? Do you have a certain uh, timeline that you could shrink it down to? Maybe it's March and April and you don't need the entire year, uh, but you were just doing a little extra fishing to be uh, over-inclusive rather than under-inclusive. Again, you want to make the request as specific as possible. Two more very quick things. Follow up on your records request. And I suggest when you do a records request, you let them know when you will be following up. Sometimes if it's a not complex records request, you can say, hey, I'll contact you in two weeks for an update. It might be a month. It might be something like that. You want to kind of judge what's the complexity of your request. Who are you contacting when you decide if and when to follow up? And finally, be nice to people. Um, you know, these are people who, uh, you know, they hold the keys to the kingdom in some uh, respects. And, uh, and you want to, a lot of times, just being nice to people, being a nice human being, um, can get you those records sooner rather than later. Um, it also can help when you're uh, essentially negotiating this because it's not unusual sometimes for the government official to contact you and say, I've got your request, but I got some questions. I'm not quite clear what it is you're seeking. Let's discuss this so we can narrow this down and get you your records. But being nice about this is, is going to get you far more records um, than not being nice about it. Uh, Catherine, I think that's the end of my slides. Am I right about that? Oh, no, here we go. Uh, real quickly, uh, your rights and the government's rights with regard to this. You don't have to tell them who you are. You don't have to tell them why you're seeking the records. You don't have to live in the jurisdiction. You don't have to be an Ohioan. If you're seeking Cleveland Police Department records, you don't need to be a resident of the city of Cleveland. Now, of course, there are times where you will want to disclose your identity or why you're seeking it because it will help you get those records. If you don't disclose your identity, you might have some difficulty when they're trying to track you down and fulfill your request, but you can judge that yourself. Certainly, there are sensitive situations where you might not want to reveal your deny you records um, in whole or in part. They have a legal obligation to tell you why. I can't promise, of course, that they always do that because I know they do not, uh, but that is their legal obligation. And finally, finally, um, you're responsible for the copying and the mailing or sending of those records. 
They can't overcharge you for copying. There's been litigation uh, about this. They can't charge you for the time it takes for somebody to search and assemble these records. Uh, but copying and sending, you can certainly be charged for. You can sometimes be made to pay that expense uh, ahead of receiving the records. Uh, the nice thing is in about in 2023, many times you can get records on computer disk or a file you know, sent to you by email or Dropbox or what have you. Um, and so it's not always, you know, United States snail mail um, that, you know, if you're going to get a copy uh, paper box full of records back, you know, all of us don't have 50 or $60 or whatever that it would cost to ship them to us. So that is essentially the 10 or 12 minute crash course that I have with regard to public records. We'll be talking about this more. Randy and others will be talking about this more. But that's what I have right now. And I do encourage you, again, if you've got other questions, you want to do some more reading on this, uh, 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 that ACLU of Ohio publication, I think, answers an awful lot of questions. Well, thank you so much, Gary. So I, um, I am somebody who is a true believer in going after those public records. And I think most people who uh, have been doing public records now and then have stories about how challenging they are. I still have one from the governor's office that I've been waiting for months. Um, so, so there are these stories where it's really challenging. And then there are times when you get the records and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm learning so much. And so I just wanted to highlight that in, um, in 2011, when there was the map making going on, you know, we, just like we just went through redistricting, a redistricting was going on, and we did a public records request right after the map making concluded. And what was important about this is, you know, one, we really wanted to understand what was happening, you know, behind the scenes and what we could actually look at. And, you know, so many of you have heard me complain about not having access to the Legislative Service Commission records, but we were able to learn a lot about the map making. So one of the tips that I, uh, I use is I often will put the same request into multiple entities because very often one entity will give it to you. So then you go back to the other ones and say, well, wait a second, I have this record and it's clearly a record and it includes you in the email. So then you can get more records from them. So in this case, in 2011, it was the Ohio House that gave us, when I saw, you know, banker boxes, 11 banker boxes of information. Um, now, in this particular case, um, we, you know, we asked to actually go there and pick them up. Once again, one of those cost things. But when you think about 11 boxes, one of the things that we quickly discovered is that they threw in everything but the kitchen sink, which was appropriate, but that meant there had to be kind of a lot of digging. But because of those records, we know, for example, that they had a hotel room that they called the bunker, that they created the congressional map in and the state legislative map in, in 2011. We know that they changed district lines up in the Canton area um, so that there was a district that would change and pick up a campaign contributor and basically pick up the Timken plant. We know that the, the district maps were approved, for example, by at that point, Speaker Boehner's team. So we learned a lot about kind of the process and some of the kind of arm wrestling over how they were making the maps. And we learned a lot about, do you remember the snake on the lake, Marcy Captor's old district? We learned a lot about how convoluted and trying it was to actually create those districts. And what it, you know, you know, and that in fact it was not the brainchild of the map makers in Ohio. Um, some of you have heard of Tom Hoffeller. Um, he, in fact, was the one who recommended this very weird, you know, this very weird map that put Marcy Captor and Dennis Kucinich's districts together. So, so I was going to say that has helped us advance redistricting reform because we understood what was happening behind the scenes. And we did a report called The Elephant in the Room. One of the things I really encourage all of us to do is, you know, we're trying to get a picture of what's happening in government so we can improve things. 
Uh, and there's so many different ways that these records can be illuminating or, uh, or identify potential problems. And with that, I am gonna hand it off to a veteran reporter and advocate for all sorts of sunshine, Randy Ludlow. Well, good evening. I'm certainly glad to be here today. One of my uh, favorite things is public records and I've continued to file requests, uh, even as, as a retired individual and helping friends and whoever inquires uh, gain public records. Um, have a couple of war stories in a moment, but I'd like to follow up on a few things Gary talked about. I can expand on a few that I think might be of interest. Uh, <clears throat> on uh, police reports, the most fundamental and should be the most easily available police report is the incident report. That is the quickest thing that's available on a given crime or incident uh, ruling by the Ohio Supreme Court. Everything on the incident report and attached narratives and supplements is public record with the exception of only two things. They must give you everything but social security numbers and uh, information from a children's services protection agency. Uh, the suspect's name, public record, juveniles' names, public record, the victim's name, public record. So if you get an incident report and it's just redacted five ways to Friday, that's a violation of the law. Uh, we mentioned, uh, Gary mentioned overly broad, uh, one tenet of the law if your request is rejected as overly broad, the agency is required by law to work with you to help narrow and craft your request so you can capture uh, the records. Uh, yes, be specific. Do not use the phrase any and all. Uh, that'll be begging uh, to be rejected as overly broad. Uh, we didn't mention courts, but... Uh, Courts uh, are obviously a separate branch of government. They are not subject to the public records law or 149.43. Uh, but however, the Ohio rules of superintendents, which you can Google online, the Ohio rules of superintendents, rule 45 uh, controls court records and how you may access them. So don't be asking for court records under 149.43. You need to get it under uh, rules of superintendents, rule 45. Um, another thing we need to mention, you may have request some records that indeed do have some information that is exempt from release, uh, whether it's attorney-client privilege, uh, the name of the uncharged suspect, outside of incident reports and things such as this, uh, the government agencies are required to use redaction to remove the exempt material and provide you with the rest of the material that is not exempt. They can't withhold a record because there's something exempt in one sentence on the entire page. They have to redact that one sentence and then give you the larger volume of the record. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, one thing it's done a lot to level the, the, uh, the playing field between uh, the public and government, which of course has Lawyers have to pay for it with our tax dollars, and we're trying to get public records. The Ohio Court of Claims does now have a public records uh, program where a citizen can file a complaint to leverage loose public records. <clears throat> Excuse me. It only costs $25. Uh, you can represent yourself. Uh, there's the master over there, well versed in public records law. If you do not first settle your case with mediation, who will rule on your case, and then you and of course, you have to hope that the state or whoever doesn't appeal it to the uh, appellate courts. Uh, right now, this well, this dates back to the pandemic. Remember the pandemic? Um, this goes all the way back to 1920. Uh, we at the uh, Columbus Dispatch, specifically me, made a request to the Ohio Department of Health to get the uh, the essentially the death certificate database. We could have all kinds of fun with that, sorting that by various things to try to identify uh, COVID deaths and where they were located and age. I mean, we could do all kinds of things, treasure trove of information. The state wouldn't release it. Uh, we worked, worked them over for months, even got the governor personally involved. And they finally did give us a copy of the death certificate database, uh, but they didn't give us uh, names or addresses, which kind of, well, addresses were a particular interest to us because we take those addresses 
I track them back to nursing homes to find which nursing homes had the most deaths because the state was not keeping that information. Uh, but anyway, we we won at the Court of Appeals, very nice ruling. Uh, went up to 10th District Appellate Court here in Franklin County. We lost two to one. And so now we appealed to the Supreme Court. And here we are three years after the fact. And the Supreme Court is now accepting uh, our briefs, et cetera, for, for a hearing for the Ohio Supreme Court. The ruling from the appellate court is that essentially the electronic or database version of death certificates contains protected health information. How you have protected health information when you're dead, I do not know. But the dichotomy of this is you can walk into your Department of Health or the registrar's office and ask for a copy of the death certificate and you will receive it on anybody. And there it will list the cause of death, yada, yada, yada. But they ruled for the death certificate database, electronic information, that it's protected health information, but I can get the exact same record on a piece of paper and it's okay. That's a complete dichotomy that makes no sense. Uh, one thing on public records, if you're fortunate enough to have someone give you some public records that, that are somewhat interesting, that you really, quite frankly, amazed that you have them, uh, one thing you can do is turn to that agency involved and ask for those records, kind of disguising it, not to reveal that you have them, but then ask them to see if you get any other records or if they withhold, illegally withhold any records that you're already holding in your hot little hands. Uh, that certainly worked for us before, uh, most notably Department of, Administra Ugh, Department of Administrative Services and uh, essentially what was a bed rigging scandal that we exposed uh, yeah, going on over there. Um, I just wanted to mention those quick few things. I'd like to leave a lot of time for questions. Uh, anybody on the panel like me to clarify anything? Yeah, one quick thing, Randy, that, that I forgot, and, and uh, uh, it's so basic and fundamental to this that sometimes I forget to relay the information to other people that, that don't do this all the time. Two things, the government entity, the public office, whatever, does not have to create records for you. And in fact, you know, 99% of the time, um, you know, of course, they will not. So if the record doesn't exist, um, uh, you know, for you and related to that, they do not have to put it in a in a format that is pleasing to you, essentially. Um, Catherine mentioned getting boxes and boxes of records. I'm sure it would have been much easier if they would have said, oh, and here's a master list of everything, and here's a summary sheet, and here's everything else to make your life easier. No, they don't have to assemble them in such a way or, or summarize them or do anything like that that will make life easier. Very quick fundamental things for people to keep in mind. Right. Well, that was one of the problems in our death certificate database case. They claimed initially that, uh, oh, we, we'd have to reprogram our computer system to generate what you want, which, of course, we knew was nonsense. I don't really know of any program that can't produce a, a comma delimited database file to allow you to work with it. Uh, but eventually the Court of Claims found that was horse hockey, so uh, that fell by the wayside as a point of contention. What and one thing I would notice, it, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I'm on Twitter, at Randy Ludlow, Randy, no space, Ludlow. Uh, had some questions today I, I was tweeting answers to. Uh, Columbus City Schools is trying to hire a superintendent right now. And the superintendent, public university president searches, uh, the personnel end of that has long been problematic because they go through all these games trying to keep you from learning who is applied because they don't want to endanger that person's current job by with the knowledge that they applied to be superintendent of Columbus City Schools. Uh, Columbus wouldn't release that information to the school board last night about who's applied saying it was attorney-client privilege. I don't understand that. Attorney-client privilege applies only to the solicitation and providing of legal advice. You cannot copy, for example, a lawyer, government lawyer, on a public record and then claim, well, the lawyer has it. It's, it's attorney-client privilege. No, it's not. Once a public record, always a public record. So be careful on that attorney-client. And uh, Columbus, as 
do the public universities and other school districts use a search firm to hire these superintendents? And it should be noted, the, the search firm may indeed have the records, uh, the curriculum vitae, the other information on the applicants for the position. Uh, it doesn't matter, public record. You cannot delegate custody and control of a public record to a third party. It remains a public record, even if I've given the only copy to my lawyer or to the search firm, or the search firm has records uh, that still an evolving case of law. And there's a horrendous really once in a Cincinnati public schools case that kind of haunts, haunts this process. But Columbus appears to be going a bit different. So we're hoping we'll be able to leverage that loose. Incredible. So uh, I, I was going to ask this question. Sorry, Savon. This was something that uh, that occurred to me because there have been periods of time where but, so this is a good example. I worked for Ohio Citizen Action and had a very small budget, um, which meant that paying for public records was actually a real problem. Um, and so one of the things that I would do is I would request to actually review them. So, uh, so I just wanted to, to encourage people, if, if you're li listening to this thinking about, okay, it, you know, how can, I, how can I save money? You can actually request to go into the office to review some documents and they'll set you up in a, you know, a room where you can review them. The other thing to do is just request everything electronically. And at this point, much of that stuff actually is electronic. The other thing is once you're asking for things to be electronic, it's encouraging them to think about these as public records to put on their website. So that there's a real benefit of that. And I cut off our, our, our host here. Sorry, Savon. Uh, not a problem at all. Uh, thank you, Catherine. And thank you to both Randy and Gary. Uh, so yeah, now we are gonna get into the question and answer portion of this. Uh, I just want to remind folks one more time that you can feel free to utilize the Q&A feature. Uh, you'll find it at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also utilize the chat function. Uh, myself and Jessica has been placing links uh, in the chat throughout the night. Thank you, Jessica. Um, we'll be compiling them. And yeah, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, our first question, um, and I'll direct this to uh, anyone in the group. Um, what agency, organization, et cetera, has been notoriously difficult to obtain records from? Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, we certainly have trouble with police records. Uh, that probably is the, the most current and problematic and ongoing public records request problem uh, we had at the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, State government, it was certainly uh, problematic uh, to get things out of the governor's office because they claim they take records. They have people do this full time, but they claim they take requests in the order in which they're received. So you could be backed up uh, behind a million other requests. I, I think it took me nearly half a year to get a copy of the governor's calendar, for example. Um, it, it, it can be very problematic, but at least it, it still tends to, tends to be better than the... Uh, Federal uh, Information Freedom of Information Act. You can have a federal a federal record show up years after you requested them. I was going to say the city of Cleveland, <laughs> right? I mean, I just think they're the worst. Sorry, Gary. <laughs> no, you, you. I was going to say the exact same thing, Catherine. That had been my experience for years, and, and my understanding still is, is that. City of Cleveland records about just about everything have, have been a problem. You know, otherwise it can be kind of like throwing a dart at a dartboard. You know, sometimes, like I said, it, it's, it's a very practical, personal kind of thing. And so a smaller government agency in a small county or small city, sometimes you might get records right away, or sometimes it might take a long time. A big city, you might get the records kind of right away, or you might get lost in a pile of records requests, as Randy is referring to. I will mention, I don't, I don't quite suggest people do this, but there was an ACLU attorney many years ago on our, on our legal list serve uh, that, you know, hooks up all of our state offices. He was doing a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act, which by the way is, is if sting federal documents or documents from federal agencies and everything, people use that interchangeably oftentimes, FOIA, Ohio Public Records Law, but FOIA is for that federal information. So 
he received a response that was, um, well, you know, we got a lot of people ahead of, ahead of you in line and it's going to take a while. So he did a FOIA request for the list of people that were ahead of him. I don't know if he was ultimately successful, but I thought it was a creative way to try to uh, uh, call out that government agency and uh, see if indeed there was a large list of people with complex requests ahead of him. Incredible, thank you all. Uh, our next question, uh, can the public get federal trial transcripts? And if so, where might they be able to uh, obtain them? Well, the whole problem, at least with in, at state court, I know, and I, I think it extends to federal level as, as well. These these court transcripts are prepared by uh, professional people. That's how they make their living: is selling copies of these court transcripts. And these court transcripts can be very expensive. We still have the problem in federal court that they want to charge you for access to their records through an online court system they call PACER. Uh, we're still fighting, trying to get that open and at no cost, but it, it has not resulted in same till now. And, and of it's course, interesting. I was going to say specifically with court records, sometimes we've been, we've been talking about this a little bit, but there will be some things with some court records that will be exempt under the law, whether it's federal law or whether it's state law. And again, that makes in some instances that makes perfect sense. So if you have a, a confidential witness or informant, um, you know, safety sensitive information that they don't want out. Sometimes they have the power under the law to, to keep that away from the public's eyes. But you always want to be cognizant of, you should, when, when you're doing a public records request, you should always have in your mind, as far as I'm concerned, they're going to deny you. So that, you know, that's not always going to happen, of course, but that's how you want to craft your records request and approach it um, in a way that makes it as hard for them to deny as possible. And what I and was I would jumping just, in. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to, I was just going to know real quick. Uh, you, there are public records that, that are effy or a little bit, you may have to dig or make a request and then see what happens. But uh, under public records law is 149.43, 149.143 allows you to get records from a nonprofit of how they have spent government money. So that is out there for you. And then we get into government hires a nonprofit or a company. A lot of times they'll have a nonprofit. And then you get into a government equivalency test. Does this nonprofit or other entity effectively do a governmental job? Was it hired by government? Is it overseen by government? Is it paid by government? And you get into this test as to whether it's records or public record. But uh, <clears throat> Uh, a lot of times they are. So if you have a government agency that's hired a nonprofit to essentially do a function of government, uh, the records, I would argue, are fair game. At least you can try it again and see what you get. Well, and my comment was kind of off topic, but I don't know about, about you, but I was super irritated that the householder trial was not something that we could see. And I know, you know, I often feel the same way about the U.S. Supreme Court. So, you know, one of the things that that as we're thinking about transparency of documents, I think that's so important. But I also think, you know, we need to be pushing for other transparency in the federal courts. You know, the fact that the federal courts don't allow cameras is a problem. Now, I'm not necessarily going to sit down and read all the transcripts, but I would have liked to watch part of the householder trial for sure. Certainly. Thank you all. Our uh, next question is directed uh, to Gary. So you mentioned personal medical records as an exemption under the Ohio Revised Code. Um, so is there a latitude for anonymous medical data of groups of people? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, uh, Randy might know the answer to that. I, I would imagine, you know, people are probably familiar with the, the joke in the legal world. And if you're not, I'll tell it. The answer to any legal question is, it depends. Uh, and I have a feeling that, that uh, when it comes to medical records, there is some of that. 
I would like to think, I can't remember where we have requested specific medical records and where I've been involved at the ACLU of Ohio, except when it might involve like a prison and jail and allegations of treatment and lack of health care and what have you. Uh, but, the, but the government, you know, they, they send and receive a lot of medical records as a result of Medicaid and Medicare and a wide variety of other things. So I think quite naturally, you know, we want that private information about all of us, um, at least on the ACO of Ohio, and we're fine with those types of exemptions. But, but anonymous data where, where names and what have you are redacted or, or never appear in the first place, I think by and large, unless there's a specific exemption, that's going to be fair game. Again, uh, under in Ohio, the wonderful thing about our law um, is that records are presumed to be open. They're presumed to be public records. And then it's up to the General Assembly, the legislature, who controls all of this. You can't, as the city of Cleveland or start passing your own public records laws. This is all under the umbrella of the state legislature. Um, so it's... Uh, um, you know, unless there's a specific exemption in there. Now, medical records, if I remember correctly, when you look at the exemptions under Ohio law, and I think medical records is number one on the list, or it's very close, two or three, and I think it just says medical records. Um, I would bet that there's a whole host of litigation about what exactly is a medical record, the difference between identifying a person and anonymous, anonymous data and what have you. Um, but uh, um, my, my half-informed speculation uh, is about the best answer you'll get out of me on this. And perhaps, Randy, you have been down this road before. Well, just real quickly, yes. Uh, aggregated data that does not allow you to identify a particular individual is a public record, or is supposed to be anyway. Uh, <laughs> I've had arguments with the Department of Health over that uh, on COVID records, for example. But uh, yes, that, that's true that uh, aggregated, if there's not linked to a particular individual, is a public record even expressly says that, I believe, uh, in the uh, Department of Health section of the revised code. Uh, thank you both. Our next question came from the chat. So in a divorce hearing from a public figure, would that be considered under a public records request? Well, do you mean the actual hearing itself or a record of the hearing? Uh, Yes, they both should be public record. Uh, divorce files are a little different in that it, there is certain information you are not allowed to get. For example, the parties are disclosing their income, their social security numbers, their property holdings, except essentially all the things that are used to calculate child support and alimony. Uh, those are not a public record. And indeed, you can go online to a court and while you may find the docket, uh, of a particular divorce, you're, you're not going to find any cases, any filings in that case available online. If you're generally interested in those, you got to go see them in person. Uh, but we, we've had to fight to get uh, divorce uh, filings open, particularly for uh, notable individuals. Uh, uh, Cincinnati Inquirer was uh, presuming one of Josh Mandel when he was getting divorced from his wife. Uh, we fought at the uh, dispatch to get the divorce file open of the late Chris Jordan and his wife up in Delaware County. Parts of it have been uh, improperly sealed. Uh, so yeah, there's things to keep an eye on there. Courts generally are very good in releasing records. Uh, you start getting into adoptions, divorces, things like that with personal information, it can be a little more touch and go. I thank you, Randy. Uh, our next question um, is it illegal to deliberately stall or withhold records when requested? And what's actually considered a reasonable time frame? Uh, I think with a you know reasonable time frame, we get back into this it depends world. And uh, by the way, you know we I've been doing all these webinars throughout COVID, all these other types of things. You'd think I'd be totally used to this. I got my window open across the room and I realized there is a partial eclipse happening on my skull. So I apologize for that, uh, that I'm, you can see half of me and, and not the other half of me. But uh, um, Fort is going to, at least in our experience at the ACOU of Ohio, is they're going to weigh all of the factors uh, and, and you know, really anchored in the complexity of somebody's request. 
you know, we oftentimes do very simple public records requests, the type that Randy talks about, the incident reports with police. We, the very first thing I worked on at the ACLU of Ohio uh, was when the city of Cleveland was dumping homeless people uh, in the outskirts of the county because they didn't like them hanging around the new ballpark in Tower City and everything. We had homeless clients coming to us or potential clients claiming this. Um, but the thing about dealing with, with a lot of homeless people is, you know, they don't have the dates they you know they can tell you why i think it was around christmas because there was a christmas display in the you know in the, in the department store window and stuff but they can't be like well 7 45 p.m on friday december 28th so we did our due diligence uh you know they had people saying look this is happening to us time and time again i've been dumped by police five or seven times so we went and we tracked down the incident reports and sure enough you know, it would match up with our potential clients' names and those individual officers. An example of, of an easier type of request to uh, uh, document data, what have you, uh, to produce. At the same time, you know, I've been part of some very complex public records requests with our prison system, with the governor's office and other people. And I think courts sometimes, you know, I'm not happy many times with what courts do with public records. Catherine and others have mentioned how nice and how um, good Ohio's laws are, you got to worry about the courts, though, and what the courts do in their interpretation of, of this, or who aren't quite so friendly uh, about transparency and, uh, and uh, making uh, uh, their uh, other branch of government turn over these records. But I think many times a court's going to approach these as essentially human beings and look at that, the complexity of the records request, you know, the claims from the government officials about how long it might take them to produce or not, or the difficulty of doing it. You have some government entities that keep records off site. Um, so they, you know, somebody has to go and retrieve them. Again, I don't want to make excuses by any means for government entities or public offices doing this, but, you know, I can forecast many times based on the complexity of the request and who it's going to a general time frame for how long it might take to fulfill that request. Some requests, I wouldn't dream of saying, hey, I'm gonna check back in in a week and see where you are with this request. But at the same time, like other people that have talked to tonight, I have an outstanding request to the governor's office on COVID deaths in prisons uh, and, and DRC, uh, the prison systems um, uh, preparations for COVID and, and handling it within the prison system. It's all pre pretty moot uh, at this point, so I don't really care. We, we learn this information through other avenues, um, but formally speaking, we still do have a, a public records request that's a few years old that has been unfulfilled at, at the governor's office. So again, the, the short answer is it gets back to one of these it depends kind of things, but there are, you know, the, 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 the only real enforcement mechanism there is in Ohio law, unfortunately, with regard to this, is to go to court and sue over this. And you can do it in a couple different ways. You can file with the, with the local court. You can file what's called a mandamus action with the Ohio Supreme Court, or Randy touched on it earlier. In Ohio, when we did it, my knowledge in talking to ACLU people around the country is at that time, we're the only state doing this to our credit where ordinary citizens, media, the ACLU or what have you, can go to their local court of claims and, and enter into this mediation process to get records. The idea behind this was that the Ohio Supreme Court kept getting records requests, cases brought to them. The Ohio Supreme Court, they're a very busy body, a very busy entity with all kinds of things going on. And people were forced to continually go to them with very simple requests where there is no doubt they were obligated to get this information. But you will also have government entities that essentially treat this as sue us. And a lot of people that come to the ACLU, they have exhausted trying to do this themselves. So, uh, you know, they got the ear of some people in the legislature, you know, can we do something about all these records requests we get that just, you know, shouldn't be coming to us because, again, they're clearly entitled to these records. And this mediation process uh, was created. I haven't talked to anybody very recently about it, but I know after it had kicked off and talking to some media people about it, uh, it was really working as intended uh, to our credit. So that's a nice wrinkle. Um, it's always nice to talk about positive things we hear in Ohio, have here in Ohio. And I think that court of claims process is one of them. Uh, thank you, Gary. And um, 
Another question that we had from the chats, um, and I think it actually ties in nicely to something that you were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, could you explain the difference between doing a mandamus action versus the court of claims process? Yeah, I, I think, you know, hopefully I answered that just, just now, you know, mandamus is a, you know, it's a particular uh, legal, for lack of a better word, instrument or process, you know, where you can, you can file with a lower court, you know, a, a trial court or, or an appellate court or go straight to the Ohio Supreme Court. Sometimes that might make sense, depending on the time sensitivity of the records that you're seeking to go immediately to the Ohio Supreme Court. Sometimes I think the Ohio Supreme Court certainly appreciates that a lower court takes a crack at it, but that court of claims process that you know Randy covered, $25, it's a mediation process. Either side can appeal if they are uh, unhappy with it, but um, I am hoping I haven't assembled any data or looked at any research or know if anybody has it anywhere, uh, but I would like to think that it has unclogged at least part of our courts uh, because people are able to, to, to do this. And I'll mention, you know, yes, you can go to court and enforce this. And what you can get as a result is not only the records, uh, but, but you can get, uh, you know, essentially money uh, in many instances as a result of this is, you know, essentially a disincentive uh, for these government bodies not to be continually denying people's records. Um, so, you know, there are occasions where, where you can get uh, maybe a small amount of money for your trouble and the, the effort uh, uh, that you put in. Ohio's put some, uh, some guardrails around that with regard to, uh, you know, what they think are pesky people that continually request records for a variety of, of reasons, um, you know, and, and, and so essentially there's something in the law you can only request X number of records under a period of time unless you can show that, you know, it's for this or that purpose. I don't have the exact language off the top of my head, but uh, um, again, that, that court of claims process is, is there and available uh, to people to utilize. And, and there's information online about how to do it. You can do this online, I think, in many places, if not all places. And uh, uh, I tell people about it all the time. Randy, you'll appreciate it. I've told plenty of reporters in Ohio about it. You know, they'll contact us about public records. I get on the phone with them. But you know about this court of claims thing. And sometimes it's a reporter that's brand new to Ohio. And uh, because they just, you know, they might have been here for a month or two. And you say, hey, take a look at this court of claims thing. And you're like, well, thank you. You know, I, I, I try to tell everybody in sight about the court of claims process. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, we have time for one more question. And uh, to folks who had questions who unfortunately weren't able to be asked, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of our lovely panelists. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer your question. Um, but this last one's going to go to Randy. And um, this one's a fairly simple one. Are Crime Stopper calls public? Well, most local Crime Stopper programs are nonprofits, so they're not governmental. Uh, they have relationships, certainly. Um, you could certainly try on the government end to see what you can get. Uh, but again, they would be likely, once in possession of government, to redact any information that would identify the party that's reporting or, or providing a particular tip, even though you can remain anonymous, they have other things they might be able to use to figure out who it was. I, I think you might potentially be able to get that from police agency, but certainly you're not gonna get any information about who submitted the tip. Thank you, Randy. and. Uh... Thank you, panel. Uh, so to our folks who are here watching, you are now hopefully ready to make your own public records request. Um, Catherine's gonna be pulling up a slide uh, very shortly, but uh, that'll have all of the links from the chat here. And um, we're gonna be sending out a follow-up email with all that information. So um, again, thank you to Catherine, thank you to Randy, thank you to Gary, and uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we'll give a couple of seconds to share the slide and then, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you all soon for our next chat. Thanks. Thanks. Now it's time to go off and make your own public records requests. We're going to be sending you all this information. There'll be an email coming your way very soon. Um, so this is the information that was shared in the chat. Um, and then, you know, if I missed anything here on this slide, um, you know, Randy and 
Gary will let me know and we'll add that in. So a big thank you to Gary Daniels, a big thank you to Randy Ludlow and Savon, thank you so much for, you know, guiding us along and, and thank you so much to absolutely everybody for joining us and let's go make some public records. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night, y'all.